I ever leave this world alive I'll come back down and sit beside your feet tonight Wherever I am, you'll always be More than just a memory Well, if I ever leave this world Hey folks, Professor Finn here, and today we're going to be discussing what you should be doing uh, to improve what you're doing in mortuary school or getting ready on what you should be doing in mortuary school when it comes time for you to start taking your classes so that you will retain your knowledge over a large period of time. This is a different type of study style from normal classes. You will not benefit by just running through cramming information because when you are forced to recall it in the future, when you are taking comprehensive exams, uh, stuff during your practicum or your board exams, you simply won't have the information because you crammed it and you lost it. So it is very important. It is very important that you learn to study for the long term so that this information is retained. And the logo here uh, belongs to the Central Florida Ghostbusters. I'm something of a ghost head and I've purchased a number of patches over the years. And uh, this is just a shout out to them. Uh, hope everyone up there is doing well and that they enjoyed the new Ghostbusters Afterlife movie. So where do I find this? Well, Way back when dinosaurs roamed the earth and I was in community college earning my first degree, um, I was heavily involved in student government and went to a number of different workshops on behalf of student government and various clubs uh, and societies I was members of. So it comes from my experience in those workshops, books I've read, personal best practices, uh, but two ideal texts, two ideal textbooks that I will recommend to you are Bridging the Gap Between College and Law School by Ruta Stropis and Coming to Law School, How to Prepare Yourself by Ian Gallagher. Because both of these talk about the same exact techniques that I have in this presentation uh, and why they're necessary and how and why it is that um, these things are effective. So I cannot stress enough to you that if you have the time read these books. They're very, very short in comparison to large textbooks, you know, easily under 100 pages. And you could finish this depending on your reading level in one night over the course of two nights easy. So the first thing that you should be doing, the very first thing you should be doing is read your damn syllabus. I don't need you to be able to quote the thing from memory by any stretch of the imagination, but look at it. Had a student ask me one time, what's your office number so I can call you? You're kidding, right? It literally is the first thing that you're going to see if you look at the top of the first page. Absolutely look at your syllabus. See what information you're provided. What is the instructor's email? Do you have that email? So that the instructor has said, hey, please don't use my school address. Use this one because the school address is wonky or doesn't populate to my digital devices or whatever the excuse is. You want to know what it is and how it is you are to contact the instructor of the course. Two, is there anything here? Is there anything that the instructor is telling you right up front? This is a good way to study. So this is an excerpt taken from one of my syllabi. Take good lecture notes, which is what this presentation is all about. Participate and ask questions when you don't understand. Read assigned chapters and any handouts. Complete any study guides I give you. Make use of online reference and study aids provided by the instructor in the learning management system. And memorize terms and definitions. These are ways that you will get through this course. Online components. So if you have, and generally speaking, 
I don't know of too many colleges or universities that do not use a learning management system, even for face-to-face classes. I'm not saying that they're not out there, that the face-to-face elements, uh, there, there, there's absolutely nothing online with those classes because there are still professors that do that. But the probably majority of classes out there are what are known as web enhanced. So you go to class if it's a face-to-face school, and then in the online portal, there are things for you to do, or there are things for you to read, and you know there is some element that is uh, utilizes an online uh, system in some way, shape, or form. It behooves you. It behooves you to watch the orientation videos on how to navigate the learning management systems. Now, when I started teaching, it was a system called Angel. This was purchased. Uh, by Blackboard and became Blackboard. I have been trained on Canvas. I have been trained on Moodle. Uh, I have gone through some workshops with Brightspace. There are so many learning management systems out there and everyone does something a little bit differently. You absolutely need to watch the orientation videos. And if you are literally too lazy to do that, at least have the common courtesy to go on YouTube and search for a video that is showing you how to do whatever it is that you can't figure out how to do because you didn't want to watch the video. I, I just have to be honest. If I go on YouTube and I type in how to submit something in Blackboard, I will likely find dozens of videos of all the versions of Blackboard until I find the one that I'm looking for on how to submit an assignment or whatever it is I'm looking for. Explore the class. Click on everything. See what's going on, where things take you. If there are broken links, let the instructor know so that things like that get remedied. If your college program has a tutoring staff, whether it's peer-led or whether it's instructor-led, whatever it is, take advantage of it. Take advantage of the tutoring. You may not have tutors for every subject, but you do have tutors for some of them. Use them if you are able. And I will tell you in mortuary school, there is safety in numbers. There is safety in numbers. Having a study group is super, super, super important. Because as you study together, you will likely mention something or someone will mention to you something you did not think of, and that will quickly become part of your notes. Make sure the people in your study group understand it is not a social hour. You are there to study. If you want to have a social hour after, fine. But while you are studying, you must be dedicated to the task. And if people in your study group do not want to study, get them out of your study group. You do not have time for dead weight. The people in your group should have one singular purpose. Pass mortuary school. Do your own work. Do your own work. Paraphrasing is a great way to study. Direct memorization only gets you so far. And time and time again, you'll hear people say, well, if you can teach it, you know it. If you can teach it, you are likely paraphrasing it. So an example here has to do with restorative art. There are many ways to dealing with leaks from abrasions. Typically, a surface compact of phenol or cavity fluid is used to cauterize or dry the area. Depending on the severity of the leak, something like a spray adhesive, pore closer, plastic seal, or cotton and plastic wrap is utilized to close and cover it up. And if you paraphrase this, it could be something like, you need to burn it and seal it. You need to burn and seal abrasions. So how do I burn something? I could use an electric spatula. I could use carbolic acid or phenol might use cavity fluid. If I don't have access to any of this, I might even just grab some massage cream, put it on there, and then use literally a clothes iron in an attempt to dry this thing out. I could even just take a hair dryer 
and blow some warm air over the abrasion until it dries out. So I need to burn it or I need to dry it and then I need to seal it so it doesn't continue to leak. What are ways I can seal it? I could use spray adhesives. I could use heavy adhesives or medium viscosity adhesives. I could cover it with wax if it's completely dry and solid uh, and I don't, might not need to use an adhesive and then smooth it out and use cosmetic to cover it up. That is how I seal it. And then I even went so far to say, how do I hide my work? That is how you know that you know it. And there is a surprising amount of content available on the internet, whether it's on Quizlet or Study Stack. Googling a topic or doing a search for instructional aids on YouTube will give you some great results. If you just type in embalming, you probably have happened across one of my videos. That's how you discovered my video. There are plenty of things out there if you know where to look. You might not find the ideal thing you're looking for, but you will probably find something that will help you in some way, shape, or form. And it's necessary to understand that funeral service education, mortuary science, is a limited scope program. If you are told only to do something, just study that. Don't go any further. So as an example, if you are needing help in accounting and you go on YouTube and you look at accounting videos and getting really deep in the corporate tax accounting or something, you can probably forget all of that because there's nothing you need to know. You need to know a basic on something. So make sure that you're only looking at something that is giving you the basics, making your notes off of the absolute basics because you should be able to correlate something you heard in class to something that is being said. And it is that probably most simplistic part. You have what you need. Move along to the next thing. Study sites like Quizlet exist solely to help you learn. Find those sites. Bookmark them. Don't be afraid to look at the Quizlets of people from schools you do not attend. There are nearly 70 mortuary science programs in the United States. Look at other people's stuff at other schools. Look for those little things that you're missing. And you'll be surprised how much it helps. And if you find something good, Hey, man, send it to the instructor. Instructor might put it into a resources area or send it to the library where the library maintains a list of helpful links or study places for students. You never know. So how do you, how do you study? How do you prepare? First thing, read prior to class. Your goal is not to come to class and listen to the instructor read you the damn book. It's just not. That is not the way it's supposed to work. In college, I was frustrated by going into class and all the instructor would do the entire time is pass a book around to each student who read a paragraph from the book. Like that is supposed to help me learn anything. I read the book. Let's talk about what I read. It is important that you read subject matter prior to class. This allows you to formulate your own opinions on items. You've started taking notes, identify items for discussion or clarification. So you're making the most of the instructor's time. And you should probably read a chapter a minimum of two times. That being said, read parts of paragraphs or sentences you don't understand as many times as necessary until you understand them or identify that as an area for clarification to bring up to the instructor or send the instructor an email asking for clarification. Highlight, markup, or comment in your book. Some people don't want to highlight the first time through. That's fine. Highlight the second or third time. Some people don't do it until later. You do what feels natural. Highlighting, annotating, arrows, little post-it tabs, find a system that works for you. Personally, I found that highlighting and then annotating with an arrow or an underline works the best for me. It doesn't clutter up my page too much, and I'm able to quickly identify based on what, whether it's a green highlight or a yellow highlight or a red underline or a blue underline, what it is that is there that I am looking for. That is important in law school. You'll see that in the, uh, in the two books that I mentioned earlier. When you're reading, don't continue on if you do not understand something until you have made a good faith effort to try to understand it. 
phone a friend, look it up online, try to find a video on YouTube, or even send your instructor an email. Best, of course, is to send the email uh, to the instructor or contact the instructor for clarification. I am well aware there are professors that never check their email. Let's say for the sake of argument, those dinosaurs are few and far between. Having the professor tell you the way you're supposed to look at it, probably the best way you want to hear it in mortuary school. But obviously, you can phone a friend, look it up, some way, shape, or form. I even have people email me questions based on something they've seen on, my, on this YouTube channel where they say, oh, I heard this. What did you mean by that? I'm going to take the time to respond. Active reading will entail reading the material, asking yourself questions as you go through it, not just on subsequent readings. You can start on the first time. Looks to me like, huh, how would I use this? How could this be used against me by a professor, right? And taking notes as you go through, both in your book and outside of the book. Make your highlight, make your annotation, write something down. Always write down questions for clarification. Always write that stuff down so you make sure you get it. And if you're asked to read something in regards to a specific topic, ensure you're focusing your questions and scrutiny uh, in respect to how your reading applies to that topic and not something else. So as an example, legislative protocols in the Florida Senate differentiate uh, are different between protocols in the U.S. Senate or even a parliament overseas. If you've been told only look at Florida Senate protocols, that is the only thing you look at. Do not waste your time with other things that are irrelevant to what you're doing. You've lost time and time is precious when you're in mortuary school. In restorative art, we discuss major and minor restorations, and at the fundamental level, we don't know the specifics of restoration, um, only the classification. What is a major restoration? Something that requires a tad bit of skill and a hell of a lot of time. What is a minor restoration? Things that don't nearly require that other level of skill and generally are done fairly quickly. Not what are examples. Just what are they? What do those words mean? Don't focus on something outside of that that if at the moment you don't need to focus on. Later on, you will be able to determine, or even using common sense, you might be able to determine what is a major restoration and what is a minor restoration just by looking at examples. Take notes on what you've read. Note taking is different for everybody. Writing questions on a legal pad or a notepad of some sort is a great way to do this. And leave space to write comments or questions. Using your computer or phone to take notes also work. You can dictate. Use a uh, text-to-speech synthesis or a speech-to-text, in this case, synthesis. And if you are using your electronic devices, turn off TikTok, turn off Instagram, turn off Facebook, and do not mess around with these other things while you are studying. You may choose to do little periods of studying followed by a quick brief moment where you jump on a site just to reset and re-rev up the engine. Because if you just try to study for nine hours without breaking up into smaller portions, you're going to lose your mind. So how do you determine what is the best way for you to take notes? Well, Either borrow someone's Netflix account or dive on YouTube. What you're looking for is a documentary. Documentary about anything you find interesting. World War II submarines, lions and how they mate in Africa. I don't care what. Find something you're interested in. As you watch, take notes on what you're watching. Figure out how it is you're going to go without repeating what was said because professors don't have a rewind button. And if you interrupt them every three seconds while you try to record every word, not going to work. Got to work on how do I record the essence or the essentials of what that person is saying. So you're going to use your hands and paper. You're going to use your computer and type. And then watch another documentary and jump the other way. Try it the way you didn't do before. Once you determine whatever works for you, which one you prefer, this is how you practice it. This is how you practice it. With your notes, 
your notes should be annotated. If you're taking a course entitled Funeral Direction and you're studying Protestantism and within this topic you're learning about liturgical Protestantism on November 1st and non-liturgical Protestantism on um, November 3rd, you should start your November 1st notes with a heading, FSE 2060, Funeral Directing. Prefix a number of the course along with its titles. You know, just looking at it, where this note should go and what binder or whatever it's going to be. What the date is so that you can put these things in sequential order if necessary. And then what the major topic is, so if you're looking for something specifically, it is just there literally staring you in the face without you having to scan the whole sheet. Because time is important. And it is so much easier to look at the first three lines of something and move on to the next one if it's not what you're looking for than having to look through a whole page trying to figure out where something is. And you're never going to write everything the instructor says, nor are we as instructors going to repeat it so many times, wasting class time for you to write something down. Identify an important topic. Usually said more than once or our major headlines of slides, stuff like that. And if you've read ahead of time, you shouldn't need to write everything that the instructor is saying, just the stuff that is important for you to write down because you've already read what you should have been reading. Write concepts in your own words. Paraphrase. This assists more than writing verbatim and not understanding. And if you can't paraphrase it, you probably don't understand it, so you should probably ask for clarification. Record the class via audio. Some instructors do not permit this. Some instructors do not permit this. Can you surreptitiously just sit there, hit the record button, hide the recorder? Yes, you can. People do it all the time. People love to post their... First Amendment watchdog videos of their professors to various social media sites. It is one thing to record a person going on a rant that has nothing to do with classroom material. It is something else entirely. When you take a professor's intellectual property, because whether you like it or not, that is exactly what you are experiencing. If the professor is giving a lecture, they have likely read the book that you are using, They have selected that book, as most states require professors to certify what book is going to be used. They have added something to it. They have, they're presenting it in a format, and you are paying for the privilege of listening to them explain the matter or interact with the matter and work through the subject matter with you. So when you record them doing that and you upload it and you put it in places, you are infringing upon their ability to protect their intellectual property. You literally are. You are stealing their work, which is why instructors may not want to be recorded because they do not want other people benefiting, including other professors, from their work without due compensation. None of you should be surprised by this because if you post a video on your social media that has music playing in a background and it gets flagged for a copyright notice, why do you think that is? Because The people who made the song want to get paid for the song. So it is no more petty for a professor who does not have a platinum album to not want their stuff published for free. If you are within the realm of disability accommodations where recording is recommended as a disability accommodation, a professor cannot decline that because that is in compliance with federal law. Always write down questions. There's nothing more frustrating than a student stopping to ask questions, go, I forgot what I was going to ask. You may think, well, you know, Prof, come on, that's only, you know, 10, 15, 20, 30 seconds while I have to try to figure it out. If it happens five times during a night, that's two and a half minutes lost. And if that happens over the course of a 16-week semester, you may have up to 30 class periods. And over those 30 class periods, you have lost two to two and a half minutes. Do the math. Two times three is six. Add a zero, 60 minutes. And if it's two and a half, it's even more. 
you have nearly lost an hour of lecture time over the semester waiting for a person to go, oh, I forgot. Write it down. Write it down. And once again, leave space to mark answers later. Here's a great example. Write something down, leave three to four lines. Write the next thing down, write, save three to four lines. You'll see lawyers, they'll write one sentence of text. Skip three lines, go to the next sentence. Skip three lines, next sentence. It's just fluid. They finish writing on one line, they jump three lines, they continue the sentence. Why? So if they need to notate or annotate or make a comment or put in a reference to justify something, there is space right there where they wrote. What happens if you find out you're wrong? You wrote something wrong. You don't want to study the wrong stuff. Don't ink it completely out. Cross through in red so that you know whatever you wrote there is the wrong thing. But if you black it completely out, you go through with a Sharpie and get rid of it so you can't read it anymore. At some point, you say, oh, crap, what was that again? I can't remember what that had to do with. But if you just strike through it with a red pen, you will find that you can go back. Ah, that's why this was wrong. I remember because you can still read it. Having the visual link to your previous thinking will literally help you. So if you have been handwriting your notes up to this point, now you compile your notes into the computer. You start typing them in. Now, some people like using lots of colors when they're typing their notes. That's not recommended because if you're trying to print this, especially inexpensively or at a moment's notice and only have access to a black and white printer, you may find that as a problem. And then having to convert the colors to something different that will look good, at lack of a better way of saying it, will take more time than you should be spending. So if you use bolds, different fonts, strike throughs, whatever it is, keep it black and white, and you will find that it is much easier for you when you're typing up your notes. While you are playing on your computer doing this, try to stay off of distracting sites. And once you've typed your notes, time to make an outline. And if you have a if you're using something like Microsoft Word, it's not uncommon that you'll find uh, colleges, mortuary schools are, are giving uh, their students um, free access to something like Office 365 or Office for uh, for Education. So you'll have access to a commercial grade word processor. Take advantage of the outline tool. So a sample outline for you. We had talked about liturgical Protestantism on writing your notes, you know, name of the course, the date, what the lecture is about. Well, here's a continuation of it. So from liturgical Protestantism, what type of liturgical Protestant? Because there's different types. Well, we're talking about Episcopal. Well, who are the Episcopals? Now come the bullet points. Member of the Worldwide Anglican Communion, started in the U.S. in 1789. And these were Catholics who King Henry VIII of England kind of pissed off the Pope. And uh, he said, well, okay, screw you, hippie. I'm going to start my own religion. And away it went. So then when an Episcopal dies, what happens at the notification of death? Do you need to call father? Do you need to not call father? Is that an optional thing? Is that a local community question you have to figure out? What are the visitation considerations? Do I need a crucifix? Do I need to have a risen um, Christ rather than a crucifix? There are differences between a risen Christ in front of a cross and a crucifix where Jesus of Nazareth is literally crucified on the cross. Where do I need a kneeler? Where does the kneeler go? What are the funeral sp uh, service specifics? Is there a rubric that is used? Is there is a, uh, a, a uniform way of doing things? And yes, it's the Book of Common Prayer. Um, committal service, what happens there? How long? All the things. All the things. 
that are specific go on here. So you can just look at this and see all the bullet points that make up your notes from this section. And now you have to store your notes. You should have a binder for each class you're taking. Put your course syllabus, place it in the binder is the very first thing. So that way, if you have to contact the professor, the information is right there. If you have a question about a grading policy, the syllabus is right there. If you need to look at the course calendar, which is part of the syllabus, it's right there. If you have a calendar, break the thing down accordingly so that if you remember it was a lecture sometime in November, you can just go right to the November tab and there it is. You can always do this later as you are collating your notes. And ensure that your notes, type notes, handouts, anything in this class goes into that binder. Once you transfer it to computer, you may even add more information, semester name, the instructor, you know, a cover sheet for the binder so that you know exactly what you're looking at from the front. And as you add to your course outline, you update it and replace it in the binder. You're always adding pages to the master outline. You're always putting the supplementary notes behind it so you have a clear log of everything that is going on. And by the conclusion of the semester, especially towards your comprehensive reviews, or here in Miami, we have a course called Professional Review, try to isolate core knowledge and reduce your course outline to its main headings. And if you've been actively outlining, you're deleting all the subcategories like you saw back here, where I said, what is the notification of death? Well, you should know at this point that notification of death is optional in a worldwide in the Episcopal faith. Maybe the local pastor likes to be uh, told if a uh, parishioner passes away, but it's not a necessity in the religion. Visitation considerations, you need to have a risen Christ uh, behind the pre due not a crucifix. A crucifix is a Catholic item. Where does the pre due go? It goes right in front of the risen Christ, not right in front of the dead person's nostrils. These sort of things. You should be able to look at a funeral service specific and know, okay, the priest is going to be wearing vestments. There's going to be a pall. There's probably going to be a crucifer. Uh, you can have male or female deacons. You may have male or female priests, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. This is what happens by the time you get to that point. You look at the bullet point, you should be able to list everything in there. Prior to this, you have something much more detailed based off of your notes. And if you can't remember what something is, you can literally go look at the other outline, the full outline that you've been doing, and find all the bullet points underneath. And then you create this outline, the study outline, so that when you see a term or a subcategory, you can recall it just from memory. So if I'm trying to reduce distension, that would be my big term. And then I should know ways to reduce distension, such as injection of high index chemical or cavity fluid, channeling with something like a trocar or a hypodermic trocar, a hypovalve trocar, a hypodermic needle. I could use uh, water compresses, wet cotton with water. I could use a pneumatic collar or a water collar to squeeze things out. Uh, if it's prior to embalming, I might be able to use an edema co-injection to pull water out prior to putting in my preservative. And if it's just uh, generalized pitting edema, I might be able to just put the bottle Body at an angle or stand it up on a cot and let gravity do all the work and pull it into an area no one's going to see and treat it from there using wicking or something else. But just by looking at reducing distension, all of these things, if not most of these things, should be triggering so that you can explain what it is, what you would do this, at what time period you would be doing things, etc. And there is no substitute on earth for you doing your own notes. You buying someone else's notes, you copying someone else's notes. It is not the same as doing the work and writing your own stuff. Reading, writing, and rewriting is a vital part to the learning process. And just reading someone else's stuff has done nothing for you that you could not have done just by reading the book, essentially. It is best 
for you to do your own notes and then share your notes so that when you are sharing your notes, you are looking for the things that you missed or something that they said differently that maybe provokes a question you want to bring to the instructor because neither of you are in agreement as to what something meant. This is where the sharing notes comes into play. So now it's time to take tests. Now, unfortunately, this presentation was made in 2013 before I had a better understanding of at least how the national board exam works. So the stuff you're going to see here is probably good for getting you through school. I'll do a video uh, at, a, at another time that talks about the best way to kind of work on a board exam, because why are they different? A board exam is intended, okay, a board exam is intended by its practice to ensure that when you are choosing an answer, it is the best answer within what you are presented. So there is nothing in there that is completely off the wall. You'll see what I'm talking about here in a second. So multiple choice are typically on most exams the easiest to figure out. So in this case, I present you a question that says the following abbreviations, AML, ALL, CML, CLL are all types of what blood cancer. Now, this is a great panic question is what I call this. This is a great panic question because you see the abbreviations and everything goes crazy and you're focusing too much on the abbreviations and not the question. Uh, really, the question here is, are what type of a blood cancer? So now what do we need to do? We need to look at the A, B, C, D and see if there are any types of blood cancer here and how many types of blood cancer do we see? So the first thing we see is sickle cell anemia, right? Well, sickle cell anemia is really not a blood cancer. It is a, an evolution, is a developmental disorder of the white blood cell. So that can't possibly be the answer because sickle cell anemia is not a cancer. We have angiosarcoma. Is this a cancer? Yes, this is most certainly a cancer, but it is a cancer of the vascular system. So not probably not a blood cancer. Eh. Leukemia. Okay, well, le leukemia is a blood cancer. Um, but what if we didn't know what the definition of leukemia was? Let's go to the last one, basal cell carcinoma. Once again, we have a cancer, but is it, is it a blood cancer? No, it is a cancer of certain uh, epithelial tissues of the body. So what do we have? We have answer A isn't even a cancer. That's gone. Answer B is a eh, but it's not a blood cancer. It's a vascular cancer. And for the sake of argument, we're going to assume that the professor knows what the hell it is they're talking about. So that's wrong. Basal cell carcinoma has nothing to do with the blood at the end of the day. The only possible answer left would be leukemia. You could work your way through it. So how would this differ, you might ask? How would this differ from that of a board question? Okay. How would this be something like a board question? Well, the first problem is that you have to have multiple types of blood cancers, right? Multiple type of blood cancers. And then you would have to select the proper cancer. So more than likely, you would not see something like this on a board. The following abbreviations are all what are types of what type of blood cancer, because there's really only two types of blood cancer, lymphoma, lymphoma and leukemia. You would much more likely be asked about one of these specific abbreviations, AML, ALL, that sort of thing. Which one of these is most commonly found in females or among Asians or among whatever? And then it's going to list all four of these blood cancers and you would have to know that. That would be a board level type of question. So let's look at another one. This is another common one you might see on exams. Um, William is inventorying his liabilities account for his pet store and finds that when he foots the columns that the debits equal the credits in each of his individual accounts. This would indicate that. So this is an accounting question. 
All his liabilities are met. Debits never equal to credits. Credits never equal to debits. There is a zero balance, both A and D. Now, I am not a fan of these type of questions. I uh, When I write questions like this, it will be something called a multiple answer or a multiple select where you have to click the boxes that apply. Please choose all that apply. Uh, so you don't get the help of could it be an A and D? Could it be something else? Nope. You have to know what, what actually applies here. So if you see something like this, this is usually the easiest way to work through this question because what can you do? The first thing is, okay, both A and D. Well, let me see if B or C, if I have the time, let me start with B and C that aren't part of this and are they wrong? Debits never equal credits. Well, in accounting, the whole goal is so that we get debits equaling credits, lefts equaling rights positives equaling negatives, so to speak, which makes C wrong as well, because it's just reversal of the word. So that's absolute crap. So if all the liabilities are met and he foots his columns and he finds that the debits equal the credits, yeah, that would mean all the liabilities are met. All the liabilities on your books have been satisfied because all the payments have been made to those liabilities, which would mean it would have a zero balance. So the answer is going to be A and D. Which of the following is typically not something you would do if your trial balance is out of balance, if you were to run a trial balance monthly, because accounting is so much fun for the most, most of the people out there. So when you are given something like, what is something you're not going to do? Again, I'm Having been trained on how to write questions better, I typically will not do a not because it's a pain in the butt and people misinterpret them. And the question here is not whether or not do you know the material. The question is, can you comprehend having a not? So knowing that people still write these not questions, okay, how do you fix this? What you do is you take an advanced piece of technology called your thumb and you put your thumb over the knot so that you no longer see the knot. Okay, the knot no longer exists. The way we're going to do that here is by covering it up in black. So now the question reads, which of the following is typically something you would do if your trial balance is out of balance, if you were to run a trial balance monthly? So what are things that you would actually do? Well, let's look. Verify each of the business transactions has met the requirement of double entry accounting. Yep, yep. We're going to make sure that for every uh, uh, every entry that we have in our general journal, there is a debit transaction and an amount. And there is a credit transaction and an amount that is equal to the debit, or it is a compound transaction that has multiple debits, multiple credits equaling the same amounts. So yes, we will verify the business transactions have met double requirements or double entries requirements. We verify the posting process by checking if all post references are indicated in the journal. Um, yeah, yeah, we're going to make sure that we have post references for all of our transactions so we know that all of our transactions um, for the month are recorded. We're absolutely going to do that because that's what we do. That's how we're going to find if something's out of bounds. Do we miss a transaction? Re-adding the debit and credit columns, the trial balance to check the totals. Yep, we're going to just find out if we're just, you know, can't use a calculator. So we're going to redo the math. Count the total number of invoices from the entire year's receivables. Well, we wouldn't do that because we run a trial balance monthly. So if we have an issue... It is between the last trial balance we ran that was in order and now. We wouldn't need to go back and look at a whole year. We'd have to go back and look at a month. So which of these are the thing that I would not do? That would be D. There's our answer. By hiding the knot, we're able to identify what we would do and go from there. Now, generally when you see these sort of things, out in the wild. To make this more difficult, what you would ask is what would be something you would do and then mask it with plausible things that do not happen in that area. 
So you're having a lot, you're having three knots and one thing you would actually do, because that is the most important way to determine, do you know your stuff? Which of the following are things you would, is the one thing you would actually do surrounded by the things that you wouldn't rather than what are all the things you would do surrounding the one thing you wouldn't, which is not something you would want them to actually know. True or false? You're not going to find a lot of true and false questions on your board exam. You're not going to find any, actually. True and false isn't a thing. But why do we use it at the schools? We use it at the schools because... For the reason you see here, require a deeper knowledge of the subject matter and are precise indicators as to how well you know a topic. One word changes things, and that one word can matter a lot. So true and false are important for that reason. So income statements are reports that represent the revenue, expenses, and resulting owner's capital. True or false? And the answer here is false. Because an income statement represents revenue and expenses, what came in, what went out. If we want to know the resulting change in capital, we have to look at the statement of capital, which requires the profit or loss from the income statement. This is why true or false are horrible, because you absolutely have to own the subject matter or you're going to get burned. The term dead body is synonymous, is synonymous with the legal term cadaver. Well, the problem is, cadaver is not a legal term. Cadaver is a medical term. The legal term for a dead body is corpse. Again, this is why true and false suck. A dead body legally means the body of a human being deprived of life and entirely disintegrated. Well, once again, we have another false question. The legal definition of a dead body is it must be the body of a human being. Check. It must be deprived of life because otherwise you're alive. And it cannot be entirely disintegrated because then you no longer have a dead body. But if you're going too quick, you see all the hallmarks of what you're supposed to be looking for. And then you get wrecked. Those legally in control of the private arrangements have every right to hold a private funeral and not allow the public to attend. Well, it does say that the question is rather complex. It requires you know all the legal privilege of those in control of a funeral arrangement. Absolutely. And if you did... You would know that those legally in control of the funeral arrangements have every right to omit anyone. And if they invite you, they can revoke the invitation at any time. Plain and simple. Multiple select. Again, these are the ones that I really love. This is a play on the A and D, B and C sort of thing. Danielle Smith died in an assisted living facility, and within 30 minutes after her death, she was on your embalming table. During pre-embalming analysis, you noticed she was obese, 370 pounds, febrile, which has affected post-mortem caloricity, and exhibits a moderate amount of liver mortis. Which of the following would be correct choices? So we have a lot going on here. So let's look at the choices. 22 index, 36 index. Okay, so this has to do with the type of chemicals we would be using. All right. Raise the femoral artery and vein for the initial embalming process. Employ restricted cervical technique. Aspirate the body prior to injection. Okay. So the reason why the A, B, C, D, 1, 3, and 5, 4, and 5, 2, and 4, 2, and 3 kind of suck is because of the fact that you can just look at this and immediately eliminate stuff. This is why click the boxes that apply is so much better because it's not giving you any hints and you can't distinguish what is right and what is wrong uh, just simply by proxy by finding a wrong answer. 
So the first thing is, what do we have? Within 30 minutes after her death, she's on the embalming table. That's important to embalmers because the sooner we get a person after they die, the better the results. Protein centers of the uh, muscles are still intact, so you are likely to get best results when the body is, quote unquote, fresh. What else do we have during pre-embalming analysis? You notice she was obese. That plays into what arteries we should be using. Febrile, which plays into infectious disease and complicates things which has affected post-mortem caloricity. Well, post-mortem caloricity means what is the body temperature after death? How hot is it? And if you have a fever when you die, you are going to, yeah, have a higher temperature. So yes, it is going to affect post-mortem caloricity and exhibits a moderate amount of liver mortis. Well, okay, that would be weird being that she is only 30 minutes dead, but Okay, sure. That might be a concern if there was something asking about that. So what would be a correct choice? Well, let's look at the index. We have a 22 and a 36 index. Because she's febrile, she likely has extra stuff growing in her blood. It could be a toxemia, it could be septicemia, it could be bacteremia, uh, viremia, it could be anything. But because she is a big girl, because she has a fever, we're not going to go with the mid-grade. We're going to go with the high octane. So 36 index. So immediately we know that two has to be part of the equation because you have to have an index. And as soon as you do that, you can see that A and B get completely kicked out the door. It has to be two and four, two and three. So now you can just look and say, okay, raise the femoral artery. Well, that's where the 370 pounds comes in. You would not be raising femorals in a uh, obese person. That would be not recommended. You would, however, absolutely probably want to use restricted cervical technique. So since our choices are either two and three or two and four, the only two possible answers, it is going to have to be two and four. And we would never aspirate the body prior to arterial injection because that means we would poke holes in the aorta and then we would have to do a multi-point sectional injection whether we liked it or not. And the next bunch of slides here just tells you how to eliminate and figure it out, which I have already explained to you. One more, one more of these. In the unautopsied infant, the abdominal aorta can be used by making an incision to the right lateral portion of the right clavicle, making the incision a few inches below the xiphoid process, used by making an incision to the left of the midline, and cutting the endocardium with a pair of scissors. And we have, of course, the ABCDs and the 124s, 2 and 3s, 234, and 123. So, when you are given a question like this, where you must analyze where something is on a body, again, using your high tech devices called your pointy fingers, point to something it references and then go in the direction it's talking about. So it says here, used by making an incision to the right lateral portion of the right clavicle. So the first thing is you are pointing to your clavicle and then going right laterally, which is away from the midline. There is no way you are making an incision between your clavicle and shoulder and somehow magically accessing the aorta. So anything with a one in it is now gone. So A and D disappear. It's two, three, and two, three, and four. So we know that two and three are both part of these equations. So which one is it? Let's look at number four, because that's the wild one out. Cutting the endocardium with a pair of scissors. Well, the problem is cutting into the endocardium really has nothing to do with raising an abdominal aorta. The abdomen is below the sternum. So being anywhere near the heart means we would be in either the thoracic aorta or the arch of the aorta. So four doesn't look likely. Let's just make sure that there isn't something broken here. Making the incision a few inches below the xiphoid process. The xiphoid process is the tip of the sternum, uh, most posterior um, from, the, uh, from the chest. So it's closest to the abdomen. Yep, so you're making a cut basically from the base of the sternum down, absolutely. And used by making an incision to the left of the midline, another way you can do it as well. So two and three is going to be our answer. Just by pointing 
to where the xiphoid process is, which is the base of your sternum and going down. Yep, that accesses my abdomen. And used by making an incision to the left of the midline, if I make an incision to the left of the midline, all the way down my abdomen, I can access the abdominal aorta. Essay questions. Essay questions in school. Allow an instructor to see how well you have learned a topic because hey, can you explain it? Can you paraphrase it? As a result, when they are used, they are used to determine how well you know a concept or a subject. Bad news is you will never see one of these on a board. So you will not be able to explain how well you know something. You must point and click your way to success. It is important that you realize that these are only some of the techniques that are available to you. If you are reading ahead of time, marking your notes and writing down your questions, listening in class to the lecture, interacting with your professor, reviewing and revising your notes, outlining after that, you have touched all these topics six to eight times. This will generally cause an increase in overall grades and recall, uh, which is what, as a student, what you're looking for. Some other things you can do is you can record yourself saying things, definitions, for instance, where you hear a definition, and before you go to the next definition, you state what the term is. Or you state a term on the recording, you give yourself a couple seconds to pause so that you, when you are studying, can recite the definition from memory. And then move on to the next term. You can do that with concepts so that you are recording lectures, recording yourself reading the book, for instance, and listening to that in the car as you are driving. There are lots of things that you can do to improve your scores. This is where the time management comes in. And when students ask me, you know, what are things that I can do? These are the things you have to do if you want to put this in your long-term memory. This is why when you speak to someone that has been 40 years in the business and you ask them some question about funeral service, science, or arts, really basic stuff that's been around since the 60s, 80% of the time they can still answer the question because it was pounded into them through repetition and memorization when there was less collective knowledge to know. Problem is there is now more knowledge to know. And it's not just about recollection. It is about application and use of the knowledge, not just memorizing that bacillus anthracis causes anthrax. So folks, hope you found this video useful. If you did, like, share, subscribe, throw a comment below. You know, Tell me what success stories that you folks have had with positive studying practices. And when I do a 2.0 version of this, I can include your best practices as well. Take care, folks, and we will see you next video.